Welcome to episode 24 of Communicast, a communication skills podcast. I'm Scott D'Amico, president of Communispond, a global communication skills training organization. In this episode, I'm talking with Johnny Crowder, founder and CEO at Cope Notes, which provides daily mental health support. Check out the episode to hear Johnny's journey from abuse and mental health struggles to becoming a TEDx speaker, CEO, and mental health advocate. We discuss the importance of being authentic, why investing in communication skills is so important, and why he never finalizes his talks until the last minute. I hope you enjoy. Johnny, great to reconnect and thank you so much for joining me today. I am pumped to be here. Really looking forward to our conversation. I know it's been some exciting things going on in your world with what you're doing. So maybe just to get it started, tell the listeners a little bit about you, your journey, and really what it is that you're working on today. Yeah, this is always a hard question to answer succinctly because I'm trying to sum up 30 years in 30 seconds, but I'll say that the super high level version is I grew up with severe mental illness around abuse, and then I was in treatment. I went to school for psychology. I started volunteering in the mental health space about 10 years ago. And then now I get to work full time in the mental health space as a speaker and as the CEO of a mental health resource called Cope Notes, which I absolutely love. So it's kind of a cool, like full circle story where I grew up needing something. And then when I grow up, I actually get to provide the thing that I needed to others. That is an awesome story to be able to go back and give back and provide a service and tools that you I'm sure very much would have benefited from as you were growing up. So that must be just very rewarding and very exciting. Real quick, just kind of high level, what is Cope Notes? So the the easiest way to think about it is Cope Notes sends daily text messages that train your brain to think in healthier patterns by interrupting negative thoughts. So each text is just a few sentences long, written by a peer with lived experience, so someone just like you, and it contains a psychology fact, a journaling prompt, an exercise, some type of positive psychology information. And over time, it trains your brain to form new neural pathways associated with positive thought. Love it. And we'll make sure that we we tag you in this and get information out about your organization and the great work that you are doing. So Johnny, as you think of your experience, your path, the journey that you've been on, you know, growing through, as you mentioned, with with abuse, mental health, and now really progressing, going to school, earning the degree, starting the business, growing it. A big part, I would think, of all of that success is going to come, come down to communication. And that seems to be that's a big part of what Cope Notes is doing today. So as you hear this term, communication skills, soft skills, great communicator, whatever it may be, what comes to mind when when you hear that when they say, you know, someone is a great communicator or Johnny is such a strong communicator. What does that mean to you? It means a couple of things. So I like listening to um, podcasts and lectures and Q and a and panels and stuff. I listen to a lot of people speak and something that I really value in a communicator is your ability or the communicator's ability to translate what is in their head, kind of like drag and drop it into the head of somebody else, but in a way that is engaging and inclusive. So not just blabbing forever and using a bunch of jargon, but actually clearly and succinctly communicating in a way that people actually want to listen. So if I'm hearing that right, and I love this analogy of drag and drop, a a big part of communication is my mouth to your ears. And then Mm -hmm. the second part that people often forget about is it needs to get from your ears up into the brain. Yep. So as a communicator, what am I doing to make sure that it's not just going from my mouth to your ears, but it's going into your brain and really being processed in a way that I intended, that you're picking up the message that I was intending to put out. So a couple of things that I heard there, really be concise, be engaging, and be inclusive in your communications. And a big part of that really is avoiding all of the jargon, all the technical speak. 
a lot of times I think communicators get trapped in this cycle of wanting to maybe sound like an expert. And sometimes when you do that, you just completely overshoot your audience. They have no idea what you're talking about. It ultimately hurts your credibility. So as you're going out and you're doing speaking engagements, what are some of the things that you do to try to prepare to really make sure that you are delivering that that message to the right level of the audience? Dude, well, one thing I want to touch on, it's actually related to the answer to this question too, but the other side of that same coin with communication is being an effective listener, which I work really, really hard on um, because communication, in my opinion, is two ways. So it's not only the drag and drop from something inside of your brain into the brain of someone else's, but then making sure that you're attentive enough and patient enough to do the hard work of translating someone else's words into your own brain. So it's, it's kind of like you're responsible for both ends. Mm -hmm. If you're an effective communicator, you're, you're not only do the words coming out of your mouth make sense, but you put in the work to translate what's hitting your ears. And whenever I speak, I think about how my, a big part of my job is listening to the audience. Um, and that's not necessarily like them during Q and A and stuff. I mean, obviously you should listen during that part, but also let's say I speak at a conference. I'm not joking, dude. I never finalize my outline for my talk until very shortly before I go on, because all day at that conference, I'm having conversations with people who I'm going to be speaking with. And I learn things from them. I incorporate phrases that they use and pain points that they bring up. So in my opinion, a big part of what makes a talk great is the listening that takes place before the speaker takes the stage. And then also as the speaker is on stage, listening to people's body language, seeing if people are nodding or leaning back or checking their phone and kind of steering your talk in a direction that makes sure that you're being inclusive and you're being clear and direct. Those cues are invaluable. A couple of things you hit on there are absolutely critical. One really ties into preparation. How are you preparing for the speech, the presentation that you're going to give? In a big part, absolutely, you need to be prepared, but you can't be prepared to the point where you can't change, you can't be mm. flexible. So as you get to a conference and you you have your message ready and you're just hearing a completely or picking up a completely different vibe at that conference and you don't change just because you're too scared to, to change some words, change the structure, the presentation is not gonna go over so well. So I love that, this idea of, yep, I'm prepared, but I'm gonna be listening the whole time I'm there leading up to it and I can make you know, the audible when we get to the line of scrimmage to, to change direction, <laughs> so to speak. That's one big thing. And then, as you mentioned, once you hit the stage, while you're not necessarily hearing directly from the audience, they're not always jumping in and asking questions, looking at that body language. And there's this old adage of when you are giving a speech or presenting, you want to make eye contact, but a lot of people are just scanning the room as they're doing that. And if you're just scanning, that audience is going to become a blur and you are going to miss out on all those things you just said. Somebody's leaned back like this with their arms crossed or they're checking their phone or they're dozing off. So by really engaging with that audience, making eye contact with individuals and not just scanning, it's a great way to quote, listen to the audience while you're in the moment and realize, I need to amp it up. I'm losing them. They're zoning Mm -hmm. out because I have too much jargon, whatever it may be. That is fantastic. As you think about Johnny, some of the skills that really are important today. You know, it's an interesting time in which we live with social media, the massive shift from working to home, blended work, and even in your line of work, working in the mental health space and growing a business. Outside of some of the things we hit on already with maybe listening or really focusing on your message, what do you think are some of the other really critical soft skills or communication skills that are important today? In my opinion, humor is one of the most underrated soft skills. I had a call earlier today with um, an investor who said that they actually hire, and you don't think of investors as like traditionally hilarious people, right? right? They're like, a lot of them are like investment analysts. They're very like math oriented, very organized, kind of like that type A personality. And he was telling me that he, he specifically hires for humor 
actually because of how dry and serious some of that work can be, how high stakes mm-hmm. some of the decisions are. And I've found that in, in the current climate, humor is something, I mean, like if your team communicates on Slack and, you know, there's like someone puts, someone is talking about their day and like slides a joke in or, you know, has a little bit of sarcasm in mm-hmm. one of their Slack messages. There's something so refreshing about that, especially in a remote environment, because it can feel really challenging to engage with people on your team who are far away. Mm -hmm. And humor, I think, is this kind of unique connector where if you're sharing, you know, if you can share a bit of humor or or even, I I would say, I would expand that a little bit to be anything artistic or creative. So we've had people Mm -hmm. on our team like share a song that they've been listening to or recommend a movie that they watched that they really thought was shot well. And those types of like um, artistic or creative or even light and and witty reprieves from the complexity and seriousness of our daily life in terms of our work, that kind of stuff makes you excited to see your coworkers and excited to talk with your team. And that is one of those intangibles that you can't really pay for, but you can hire for, you know? Definitely. I I would maybe even take that a step further and characterize it around the idea or the concept of authenticity. Mm -hmm. Are you really being your true self? We, at the end of the day, we're humans. We're not Mm -hmm. robots or cogs just getting plugged into the machine. We're humans. We have life outside of work, kids, spouses, significant others, interests, hobbies, whatever it may be. And really incorporating that into the workplace, I think is very important, especially now in this remote environment. And if I think of just past colleagues that I had when they would lead their team meetings, every time they'd have a team meeting, each person, like each week, a new person would get to select music that was playing at the beginning of the team meeting. Just get to know a little bit about that. I like that. We did our all hands meeting for, for Communispond, the, the company that I lead a couple of weeks ago. And as part of that, we all just submitted pictures of whatever it could be. It could be a hobby, your kids, your pets, you, you climbed Everest, mm-hmm. whatever it was, everyone submitted a handful of pictures. And we just had it playing on a loop before our sessions during the breaks as a good way to get to know one another, because yeah. it is when you bring your authentic self to work. I think it opens up those communication channels because you know, not everyone's funny. You have to be careful sometimes with humor because if you're not, say, always that funny, boisterous person, you try to force it, it comes across as yeah. forced or inauthentic. So, but yeah, if you really just focus on being yourself and trying to bring your whole self into work and showing a little bit of vulnerability, it goes a long way, I believe, in increasing the communication channels and ultimately really bringing results forward. 100%. If you think about, Johnny, your journey from you know, where you were to going into school, earning the, the degree, starting this business now, which seems to be doing well. I, I just saw a news article recently where you, I believe you're celebrating getting Coke notes into your hometown, uh, which, yeah, which has we, been, we been adopted. To the, to the government of the county that I grew up in, which is just such a cool feeling. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you think about the success that you've had, if you had to pinpoint it down to say one or two key skills, what would you say those are? The first thing that comes to mind is, is the ability and willingness to do work with no reward. So like, dude, I always tell people, this is like, you know, a lot of times new entrepreneurs will ask me like, you know, I'm thinking about starting a business and what advice do you have for me? And my advice is always, it's not always popular, but this is my advice. I stand by it. It's, you know, the work that you want to do, like if you want to set out to start an insurance claims processing software company, I always ask people, you know, how excited are you to do that work? And a lot of times they'll say, oh, I'm fired up. And I ask them, um, how about on day 100 of no progress, people telling, you no. Um, not really seeing the needle move at all. And they're like, oh, I'm still fired up. That's only three months and change. And I say, okay, how about on day 365? So you've gone, you've gone through a Christmas, you've gone through an Easter and a Thanksgiving and a birthday. And now you're right back here on the same day you started with no 
real, tangible, outward signs of success. Your friends think you're bananas. Your parents think you're wasting your time. You know, your, your bank account is looking at you like, bro, are you sure? <laughs> and then how do you feel after two years and after three years? And I always tell people, if you can still do this same work with the same level of persistence and resilience and purpose and passion, you would be doing this on day 1,000. After 1,000 days of no one giving you an award, of no one patting you on the back, of no one writing you a million-dollar check, if you're still willing to do the work, then I believe in your company. So that, I think it's the, it's the resilience and persistence and that confidence that allows you to delay gratification almost indefinitely for the sake of your purpose. That's huge. And I talk a lot about that with as I'm talking with people in my network that want to go into people leadership positions. And I'll talk a lot about why. And sometimes you get, oh, I I want to, I can make more money. or you want the title. I want to be in control, whatever it is. But if you really think about what's the driving force behind why you're doing something, if it's for the right reason and the right reason is different for everybody, Right. But if it's for the right reason, that motivation is going to be there. Because once you move into, say, a people leadership position, it's not about you anymore. And it was 100 percent not about you. It's about your people and trying to develop them, grow them and do everything you can to help them to be successful. And so if you're going into that into it with that mindset, all the challenges and the headaches and the stressors and all those things that you're going to run into are going to be worth it because you're doing it for that reason. You have the right motivation. And for me, when I was early on in my sales career, I knew very quickly, okay, I like sales. I get it. It's interesting. But I really, my passion, especially coming out of a teaching background, is helping people, helping people be the best version of themselves that they can and to grow and to be successful. And so that was my driving force to get into management. And Really why I've stayed in you know, positions of people leadership is because it is really what gets me fired up and gets me energized when I can see those results for the people may not be immediately impacting me or, or directly impacting me, but to see the people on my team succeed is for me what it's all about. So I love it. Just having that right motivation as to why you're going into either starting a business, you know, finding the right partner or getting a promotion at work, really, what's the why? What's the driving force or the motivation? Dude, you said something really smart that I don't want listeners to miss. They probably heard it, but I want to, I want to point it out. I'm glad it's recorded. I don't say too many smart (laughs) things. I'm good that we have this recorded. No, dude, there's a misconception around like, you know, if you have a strong why, if you're mission driven, then it, um, then you'll face less hardship or it won't be as hard or anything like that. And I think that's kind of the wrong way to look at it. Mm-hmm. And it, that expectation can be pretty problematic, at least in my experience. But what you said, you didn't say if you have a good why, it'll be easier mm-hmm. or that you'll experience less hurdles or, you, or that you'll get turned down less or that even will that even that people will support you more or want to do business with you more. You didn't say any of that. All you said was the challenges that you will face will feel more worth it. Mm-hmm. to accomplish your big mission. And that's totally true. You might face the exact, and in all likelihood, you're going to face the same trials as a non-mission driven entrepreneur or founder or, or anyone else in your same position, but they will feel different because your justification in doing the work is different. If I was in people leadership role, just because maybe I can make a little bit more money or because I wanted a fancy title to put on LinkedIn, that would not sustain me through, especially over say the past couple of years that have been so challenging and yep. just so chaotic, so much going on. That wouldn't have done it. It was really about the people. How can I help all these people in my company and on my team navigate these choppy waters and come out even better on the other side and with a, a clear line to success after? So, right, you have the right motivation. You're still going to have challenges. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to get kicked while you're down likely, but it is going to be that much easier to get back up when you do have the right motivation. Johnny, as you think about your communication style and how it's developed and changed over time, who has been someone that has really influenced your communication style and what did you take from them and maybe make your own? That's a great question. I don't 
know that this is as conscious of a process as I'd like it to be. I think we're, we're all kind of like sponges, whether we Mm want to be or not. So, you know, we're affected by the books we read and the music we listen to and movies we watch and all that stuff. One communicator that comes to mind that I feel is very skilled in presenting complex principles in a way that feel legible to people like you and me who maybe didn't spend like decades and decades researching the topic he's speaking on is um, there's a pastor, Timothy Keller, and he has a wonderful way of kind of saying that everyone's wrong in a way that makes you want to listen. And I've always valued how balanced and um, how far out of his way he goes to validate people's objections. Like some people are kind of like uh, steamrollers, right? Like they get on stage and they're like, this is the thing and this is how it is. And <laughs> you're wrong. And there are speakers like that. I'm sure they ha- they do very well. There are very many popular speakers who have that kind of um, communication style. And I've always been drawn to the Tim Kellers of the world because the way they present their argument, the, the point they're trying to make is within the context of other common beliefs that people hold. And he does so in such a way that he's basically who I would term to be an inclusive speaker. So exclusive speakers say, you're, if you don't believe in me, you're just an idiot and you'll see one day. And there's, mm-hmm. there's a market for that. There's an audience for that. Inclusive speakers say, listen, I can probably imagine that you're thinking, why would I listen to a guy that's covered in tattoos who has a bunch of sneakers on his wall? That's <laughs> a completely valid question. And I'm going to address that. I'm not judging you for thinking that I understand where it's coming from. And I want to touch on it. So for me, the way that I would think about that type of approach, that type of speaker kind of goes back to how do you prepare for a conversation? How do you prepare for a presentation speech? Whatever it may be, a big part of that is anticipating the audience's reaction, Mm. whether it is the reaction to your message, the reaction to your appearance. As as you mentioned, okay, you you have tattoos, you get the sneakers behind you. Some people may just at first glance look and say, oh, why am I going to take this this guy seriously, whatever it may be. Or I remember one time going to a meeting where I was completely, completely overdressed for the occasion. (laughs) It was a very informal office environment, jeans, t-shirts. I show up full on suit, tie, crisp white shirt, shine shoes completely out of place. I didn't anticipate that. So I had to adjust quickly and address it. But as you think about that, the communication style really is, it's so important to think about what are some of the objections or obstacles I'm going to face going into this discussion and think about how can I either one, overcome them, address them, bring them to light, whether it's to make somebody more comfortable, to make somebody more open-minded or to persuade somebody to really understand, ultimately, here's what we're trying to do. Here's what we're trying to achieve. Does it matter that I have sneakers behind me or that I have Legos behind me and all kinds of crazy things for my kids up behind me? Does that make my message or the outcomes or the results that I'm going to bring any less impactful? Love it. As we're wrapping up here, Johnny, I just, one, I want to be respectful of time, but if you could share one closing piece of advice to somebody whether they are coming fresh out of school, maybe they are getting ready to start their own business. They're going down that journey day one of a thousand days to, you know, to follow their passion or really what they want to do, or maybe they're just ready for a change. But if you could offer them a piece of advice around communication skills and the important role that they'll play in that journey, what would that be? I would say, I would encourage anyone in that position to remember that the most effective communicators they know likely read books about communication, listen to podcasts about communication, watch TED Talks about communication, like read articles about it. I myself 
do all of those things and I will likely do that forever. And I think that almost everyone who is successful in their careers and in their personal life have made a measured effort to improve their communication skills. So whether that's written or verbal, listening, um, even communicating through art or nonverbal, kind of like social cues and, and body language. So I'll say this, it doesn't matter what industry you wind up in. It doesn't matter what company you wind up working for. If you start a company or five or 20, or you never work again, every hour you invest in educating yourself on how to communicate is an hour that nobody can take from you ever. doesn't matter if you get fired, you get laid off, you have to move you get to carry that forever. And there's not a single job in the world that it won't help you do marriage, parenting, uh, coaching a basketball team, <laughs> playing ultimate Frisbee with your friends. It will help you with everything. So if you're stuck and you don't know where to start, or you're not sure where to place your focus, I encourage you do some digging into learning how to communicate better and don't stop because the most effective communicators haven't. Those investments are so valuable. As you mentioned, no one can ever take that away from you and they will continue to pay dividends all throughout your career and your life. The one beautiful thing about communication skills is that they really transcend everything, whether it is the size of your organization, the industry in which you are in, the type of job you're in, your spouse, your kids, your rec you know, Frisbee golf team, whatever it may be, it's going to have an impact there. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier is this idea of being a sponge. So whether you are just directly reading articles or listening to podcasts about communication skills, or just indirectly, if you're listening to podcasts, you are reading books, articles, interacting with colleagues and friends, absorb things from them, the good stuff. If you notice some one of your friends as a strong communicator, try to pick up on some of the things that they're doing. If you have a colleague that's very successful, you know, what are they doing and maybe their work emails or the presentations that they're giving? Really be a sponge. One of the past guests talked about this concept of bloom where you are planted. So we're, regardless of where you are, whatever type of soil you've been planted in, try and suck in any nutrients that you can because they ultimately will help you grow. I love it. Johnny, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you have a great day and wish you all the best with Coke Notes. Thank you so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. A special thanks again to my guest, Johnny Crowder. His journey is so inspirational and his points about motivation and passion are spot on especially if you're looking to build your own business or even go into people leadership positions. As always, if you haven't done so, please be sure to subscribe to Communicast so that you can be notified of new episodes. Thanks and have a great day.